Um, welcome to session 2F at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Shianta Dorsey. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. I am the University Archivist at UT Southwestern Medical Center. I am also a member of the TCDL Planning Committee and your session moderator for today. Um, so I just, before we get into the presentations today, um, I have some sort of general conference and session details. Um, the Texas Digital Library and the T TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech, um, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. Um, you can also um, view um, our code of conduct on the homepage of the conference. So this session will run um, until right around 3.55. Um, and please feel free to take um, any breaks that you need. I invite you to say um, hello in the chat um, and let us know where you're joining from to share re resources or to just make general, general comments throughout today's presentation. Um, I encourage you to post your questions um, in the Q&A section um, of the Whova platform. Um, and you'll also be able to vote on other questions that you'd like our speakers to answer. Um, I will be watching for your questions and I will share them with our speakers during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. Um, so let us get started. Um, I am um, pleased to introduce our first speakers, um, Juliana Barrera Gomez and Alyssa Franklin. I will hand things over to you all to get started. Juliana, you're still Juliana. muted. I am still muted. You'd think <laughs> that after a year. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm glad that you could be here with us. Um, our slides are called Building Competence, Building Trust, Creating Culturally Competent Redescription and UTSA Special Collections Digital Collections. Um, we do want to point out that we have content in here that uh, you, you might want to be wary of. Uh, we'll be sharing some examples of problematic images and metadata in this presentation for the purposes of sharing knowledge. Uh, but some of these could contain offensive language, negative stereotypes, or depictions of violence. We will let you know uh, before we start showing our slides. So um, what is this and why are we here? We're sharing our experiences with you today to share knowledge about a project that we began in 2020. We were afforded the time to do this kind of review and rethink um, about our collections with the change in work modalities from the pandemic um, and we want to raise awareness and share and get your feedback on um, what we did. To be totally clear, we are not authorities in this area. This is not a lecture in cultural competency best practice. And we are actually positing that this kind of work, reviewing collections and thinking about how you can be more culturally competent, is actually never final or finished. It's a paradigm shift in presenting historical evidence and archival descriptive practices. So how this started, um, in June of 2020, while we were still adjusting to working from home, we were forwarded an offline chat message from a patron regarding this image that you'll see. Um, the, the message that we got said, this is disgusting and y'all need to burn that place down. Uh, clearly the patron was, was upset. Um, so what could we do? Um, our library's communication wing jumped in and they reached out to the patron. An email address was left in the chat uh, but we didn't get a response about what the, the patron was upset about. So we realized that we clearly not met the expectations of this patron and we were thinking, what could we do about it? We decided that we needed to think critically and empathetically about what might have upset the patron and what we might do to make this better. 
So we began a review. Uh, we looked at the image, we talked about it, and some things jumped out to us um, as we started cr critically evaluating this image and the metadata that came with it. Um, the description is very factual, um, but it lacks any historical context. Um, there's the note about it being a historical building. Why is it marked historical? Does that make it valuable? Uh, we felt that the use of the words slave quarters depersonalizes the fact that this place was the closest thing to a home for enslaved people who were forced to live and work on this plantation by their enslaver, who was the only named person in the title and the first person on the subjects list. So we quickly realized that we needed to learn more about how other archives and digital libraries handled describing images concerning the enslavement of African Americans as a good jumping off point. Our, he our team had lots of discussions about this and we agreed that we needed to focus on a pilot project scoping to just this photographs collection, which is called the general photographs collection. So some background on this collection, it was collected by staff at the Institute of Texan Cultures here in San Antonio. Um, which is affiliated with UTSA. Um, photographs were shared by donors and families across Texas and community members across the state. Um, and it is also made up of images used by the Institute for research and um, exhibits. Um, the bulk dates are from 1969 to around early 2000, um, though we still have a handful of images that are added today. We started looking around more and we quickly found other problematic images, dated terms and disrespectful descriptions that we prioritize flagging. Luckily, we found many helpful and timely resources that get to the crux of our issue. We needed to evaluate our collection with two goals, being aware of and disavowing the supremacy of white power dominant narratives and displaying cultural competency to increase inclusion and help build trust with our users and our stakeholders. And I'll also note that we are sharing um, an annotated bibliography that we collected of, of sources that we consulted um, as we learned more about these very important and timely topics. And we'll share that um, with users and with the slides if you'd like to learn more about it. Um, next, Alyssa will talk about uh, her work evaluating the collection. So as Juliana stated, the General Photographs Collection um, covers a wide swath of images um, from broad part points in time, and they were collected for several reasons. And their endpoint of being in our digital library, um, there's a lot of loose ends there that we are not able to track down, that you know, choices that were made generations of staff before us. And so because we focused on keywords and metadata. Um, what the one thing I did to start tackling this digital collection that has thousands upon thousands of images in it was to start identifying potential problematic themes, such as the one um, in the prior example of the enslavement of African Americans. Another topic that we quickly realized was troubling and the use of vocabulary, especially without context, could be harmful to viewers was anything around death or mortality. So you'll see here, I created a word web. And because there's not a lot of consistency in the metadata and the descriptive word choices that were used by various individuals over the decades, you would I would have to keyword search a lot of things related to that original vocabulary word. And then we would sort of build a net out from that and we would have core <clears throat> core themes from which to work and identifying um, word choices that we would want to review and descriptive practices of particularly difficult imagery. And so this ended up resulting in a holistic review of the collection, but we identified several focal points from which to then span out. And I think we can go ahead and do slide. So I'd just like to mention again that I'm going to be sharing some examples from the collection that can be difficult and troubling and have graphic subject matter or insensitive word choice. So just a reminder on the content warning and slide. So this image, um, upon first glance, you can see that the Texas Ranger with his boot up on the tree is the subject of the photo. And the title is pretty straightforward, Texas Ranger E.J. Banks outside Mansfield High School during school desegregation, desegregation incident, 1956. Um, slide. Unfortunately, you will notice um, 
displayed at the top of the school building over the portal is an effigy of a black male. And um, during the protest, this was displayed. And so it is also framed in the photograph and you will see it in the description. We've underlined um, highlighted word choice with red lines so that you can um, pick out um, particularly difficult parts of the metadata. And so an issue with this example is it's, I guess it's the lack of tone or the tone and the lack of empathy. And it's a factual description of what took place, but is it done tactfully? And that's just something that we've, con we've continued to think about. Um, slide, please. So here's another example. This was probably a reference image for ITC staff. And you'll see in um, the title of the print, Suburban Mexican House, it's in the image itself. And when we go to the next slide, again, you see the description visible house is circled, but the description field, um, somebody that manually input descriptive information made a cultural value judgment about this housing and Cho actively chose to use the vocabulary word shack to describe the structure that is labeled a house in the image itself. Slide. This is another image that without any context, that was the title that's the only descriptive image or uh, descriptive information we have for it. The choice was made to put the title in quotes, but it still leaves something to be desired for our viewers and with slide, please, next slide. Um, you can see from the description, it's just, it is a family. And so um, from what we know about the photo, they were probably performers, um, but we don't know anything um, in the Texas State Fair, but we don't know anything else about them and that just title and word choice without any supplemental information or additional description, you know, it just doesn't sit well. And slide, please. We also have several, what we have come to learn are souvenir photographs, um, photos that were taken of battles that happened in Mexico and Texas and of deceased soldiers. And then they were, they were printed on postcards and sold as souvenirs and um, very disrespectful to the deceased. And so if we go to the next slide, You'll see the title of the postcard at the very top of the screen. It's that's the description printed on it, piled, ready to be burned. You know, there's no empathy here for the fact that these are dozens and dozens of humans that have lost their lives. And then you see in the description field, which again was something that was created um, by the ITC or UTSA staff, you see pile of the dead from Battle of Matamoros. And so just again, thinking about how to describe this difficult and very graphic imagery with empathy and respect and at the very least context. And uh, next slide, please. And so this is probably um, one of the more difficult images, probably could have used an additional content warning um, just for these sets. But we had some images that we, I wasn't even aware were in our digital collections of a clan meeting from the 70s. And if you go to the next slide, a particularly difficult discovery with this was um, in our local subjects, which is um, a field that displays in our digital library content DM, it had been tagged by a human being, not just photographs and photography, which is on every photographic image in the digital library, theoretically, it's a photo, so it's tagged as photography. Somebody, we do not know the context. It could have been a mistake, but it was tagged activism activists. And there's this series of these photos. You see, I showed a couple additional examples here from the Klan meeting and they all had this local subject tag. This tag is used by our department, not for this purpose. Um, it was designed to be implemented. We have a lot of, one of our collect collecting foci, is on local activism and activist groups, political activists, Mexican-American activists, for example, in San Antonio is one of our major focus areas and collection strengths. And you can see how um, clumsy keystrokes 
at best can really cause some damage when you're misapplying terms that were that do not fit the subject matter. And then we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So additionally here, a historic photograph, it is a male appearing person in a woman's bonnet and cap doing laundry. Presumably it's comical because he's dressed up in women's clothing doing quote, women's work, right? And so then we go to the next slide and we notice an additional troubling um, poor choice in subject term, this time in general subjects, not local subjects. So these are um, much wider swath in vocabulary. Um, and somebody had applied transvestism to this, I, I guess with the traditional understanding of the word being that a male appearing figure was wearing traditionally female clothing. But obviously we can see that that term is being misapplied here. It is disrespectful to the LGBTQIA community and it's an inappropriate choice, especially paired with costume and comical without context that is again, a hurtful cultural value judgment that we would like to spare our users from. Uh, slide please. So a takeaway from all of this work is always being actively mindful of the toll that these troubling images can take. Acknowledge the weight of emotional labor that these projects inherently entail. And I felt that this was especially important when considering having our student workers um, assisting on this project. They did go through some of the collections because like I said, we've got thousands and thousands in general photographs and we needed additional eyes and pairs of hands to be able to assess the collection holistically. But you do need to balance that in our opinion with the difficulty of the task and just checking in on the students and making sure that this is something that they are comfortable working with and that they are aware of the types of images and word choice that they'll be coming across. And in the handout that Juliana mentioned, um, we have a resource um, that specifically highlighted this and it really stuck in my mind. And I think it's a great thing to be mindful of uh, going forward for many different types of projects. Uh, slide. Back to you, Juliana. Okay. So um, that was quite a lot of work that we did, the, the bulk of the work in 2020. Um, we were able to write a report that uh, highlighted a lot of the problematic images and the metadata that we found. And we shared this with our library's leadership um, with the idea being that they needed to know about what we found. And uh, we got good feedback. We heard that they were very interested in um, and meeting with faculty and students um, at UTSA, but also with our wider community in the San Antonio area, South Texas area, especially um, to start talking to people um, about these very important topics. Um, another thing that we made sure to do as quickly as possible was to create a content warning on our landing page. Um, you could see this to your right, uh, that just kind of goes over um, the same things that we've been talking about, that, it, that you need to be aware it could have things in it that we might not have even found because, um, again, going through thousands and thousands of images um, that you're you're likely to miss things. But it's also an iterative process. Um, we also highlight uh, we created a statement on language and content that we put in this content warning note, and we invite people to uh, contact us if they would like to um, share any comments or questions. So this is our um, our entire statement it's very text heavy um, but it's hosted on our website um, and i'll just say that it, it outlines our goals for transparency um, and archival reliability but it also acknowledges that that can cause offense um, but we wanted to say we realize that and we want to make it better and that this work is ongoing and it's not finite um, it explains that we value cultural competency and awareness um, how we plan to convey context to users that we know that that's important and how we'll work to aid them with their research using the preferred terms of communities that are represented. It encourages our users to reach out to us so that we can learn from them and have a dialogue as well. 
Um, we also wrote this in a more casual voice. Um, we wanted to free it from, from any uh, policy speak that you know, might make viewers, when you think about it, possibly upset viewers who are reading this feel alienated um, or could otherwise just make us sound cold. So we still have quite a lot to do. Um, we definitely, our, our next step is we need to do community outreach. We need to meet with people, as I said, in San Antonio and South Texas area to start talking to them about what their preferred terms are, how we can supplement our metadata with that. Um, and we need to value that labor too, because as Alyssa said, it's it, putting that kind of ask on people is a lot and getting that knowledge from them is a lot. Um, we also wanted to come up with methods for sharing context with our about our problematic images. Um, we are thinking about ways that we can address this in finding aids or in libguides um, and also outreach that we can do to kind of share knowledge about, um, you know, why these types of things, why there might be postcards of dead soldiers, um, that that was a thing that was acceptable at a certain point in time um, to educate the public and maybe increase dialogue about it. Um, we need to expand our work to include our entire photographs database content management system. Um, there's a lot more images in there that have not made it into our digital library platform, Content DM, um, and metadata there too that needs to be looked at. And um, additionally, we are looking at how we can investigate um, flagging images. Um, uh, in talking to students, we, we understand that they um, know that like in Instagram and other, uh, you know, image sharing platforms, there's ways that you can opt in to see an image that someone has flagged as being objectionable. Um, but, you know, our library system doesn't allow you to do that. So you just see the image immediately. And we're trying to think of ways that we can make that better. Uh, but the biggest thing is we're, we're going, we're committed to building our knowledge of cultural competency and how we can improve our archival description. Um, it's a mindset change. It's not an endpoint. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And I believe we're going into Q&A now. I will stop sharing. Is that right, Shelta? Yes. Thank you so much, Juliana and Alyssa, for your presentation. Um, I, um, Juliana and Alyssa pri um, provided a list of resources that I added um, in our chat, if you would like to take a look at them, please do. Um, Juliana and Alyssa, did you want to add any um, details about the list um, you all compiled before we go into the Q&A? There's a lot of really great resources <laughs> that are very timely. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, Alyssa did a really great job um, annotating the, the bibliography and kind of putting in a blurb about, you know, some key takeaways that we had um, from doing these readings. Um, it just, I also have to say, it's a weird thing to say, you know, that there's a silver lining to the world being turned upside down with the pandemic, but it really was great to, to be able to dive into this and say, okay, this is an opportunity for us to, to really start learning more. And um, pulling in other people's examples, seeing other people who have put out language statements and, um, and learning what they decided to include and, and what kinds of um, wording they were using. We felt like there were just really great examples out there that helped us. Thank you so much. Um, you, everyone, if you have any questions, please go ahead and add them to the Q&A um, section. I'll give you all a little time if you need some to, to think of any. Um, we do have, I do have a comment from Courtney Numa. She says she want, I want to express gratitude to Alyssa and Juliana for their emotional labor doing this work as well as presenting it to us. I can see the pain of presenting these examples is a heavy lift. Um, I um, absolutely agree. Um, I've worked with civil rights um, collections in the South regarding Af African-Americans, so I know um, the emotional um, toll that can be taken on reading um, or interacting with white supremacist um, description, um, as well as language and expression. Um, so um, I'm giving 
to be cleared, um, Lauren Goodley, um, she asked a question to be clear, did the work include clicking through and viewing each item in the online collections? Uh, yes, it did, because with the nature of the metadata just being all over the place, there was just no other way that I felt like we would even have a chance at covering difficult or graphic imagery or inappropriate word choice without visually assessing the displayed image and comparing that to the words that were used to describe them. Um, and so, yeah, that involved, we started with those word webs and those topics, like I mentioned earlier, and then we ended up doing that holistics uh, click by click review and we kept it to what is in the digital collection. Um, like Juliana said, future work would include also diving into the, our personal kind of back end photo database that has exponentially more images than are displayed publicly. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, should there be um, regular evaluation of the language used to describe collections? And if so, um, how often should it be done? I think the short answer is yes. Definitely, it's needed. You can see from this project, there hadn't been an evaluation to this scale or of this nature done by our own department, I guess, since this inception, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I think that as of right now, we don't know how often it's going to need to happen, but we are very aware that this is an ongoing dynamic process and especially considering as um, vocabulary, you know, evolves over time, it's inherent in language. And so, for example, the example of the vocabulary term transvestism, several decades ago, it might not have had the sting that it does to viewers today. And so we will just constantly be needing to update and evaluate vocabulary choice. Did you have anything to add, Juliana? Yeah, um, as we talk to our communities too, it's gonna it's gonna come down to uh, creating a dialogue with them so that we understand uh, when when they have a new preferred term, um, when other people join communities and they have different terms that they'd like to use, when uh, research starts using different terminology um, that is more helpful, uh, more approachable. You know, it's it's a like Alyssa said, it's an ongoing process. Um, I think a bit we we jumped over a big hurdle though, because this was such a big legacy collection. Um, one that was collected, you know, uh, honestly before Alyssa and I were born, um, you know, it, it's a, it, it, it's been there for a long time. And um, this, this particular collection too was a little um, different. It, it wasn't really meant for public consumption at the time that it started. Um, when ITC staff were collecting it, it was kind of, you know, their internal um, images that they used for research. So I think that's to, to kind of put a little bit more context in it. I think that's also why some of the uh, descriptions are very cut and dry and, um, you know, don't really have any empathy um, with them. It's, it's because it was supposed to be something that research staff were quickly looking at, but there's problems. Okay, thank you all again. And we're going to continue with our second set of speakers. Um, ben Brumfield, Alyssa Guzman, and Albert Palacios. I will hand things over to you. Thank you. All right. Um, as Shanta said, my name is Alyssa Guzman. I'm the digital scholarship librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and I'm here with my colleagues, Ben Brumfield from Brumfield Labs and Albert Palacios, who is the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Leela Spenson, also located at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and today we're gonna talk about a grant funded project that we are currently working on um, to crowdsource multilingual transcriptions of primary source materials and um, to store those in our repositories, contribute them to the archival record. Um, so we have been working with the software called From the Page. Um, From the Page is software for transcribing primary source documents that are difficult to conduct OCR with. 
Um, it's great for crowdsourcing um, and it's used by libraries, archives, and museums all over the world uh, to transcribe and translate their primary source documents. Uh, we're working with two different installations of From the Page, and you can find them at both of these URLs. So there's um, one installation that's hosted by the University of Texas, um, and then fromthepage.com, where um, Ben and Sarah Brumfield offer that as a software as a service option. Um, so it's really important for us to situate the participants in our crowdsourcing projects. Uh, as citizen contributors um, and recognize the meaningful intellectual labor that they provide uh, when they're participating in these projects. Um, so we have two goals um, for our project. Um, the first is breaking down barriers to accessing our um, Spanish and Portuguese language collections. Um, all of the software and interfaces um, that we use to manage and maintain our digital collections have interfaces that are in English. Um, and we wanted to be able to collaborate with uh, the Benson's current Latin American partners to do digital scholarship work with their collections that are hosted on our servers. So we have three sets of deliverables. Um, the first thing that we worked on was internationalizing from the page into Spanish and Portuguese. Um, as well as conducting the infrastructure work that would enable other future projects to translate from the page into different languages. Um, we're also introducing some faceted browsing features because we're working with large collections of documents and we wanted to improve discoverability within the from the page software. Um, and then right now we're working on enhancing the export features of from the page. Um, and developing some accompanying workflows and sets of best practices for exporting all of these fantastic transcriptions and translations from the from the page software and um, including them back in our various repositories. So our digital asset management systems, our data repositories, um, et cetera, for future preservation and reuse. Um, and then along with that, we're having a lot of conversations about how do we provide attribution for the people who worked on these crowdsourcing projects um, when we take the transcripts and the results of their labor out of from the page. So uh, this is just some of the things that we're taking under consideration as we do this work. So again, we're working with citizen collaborators um, on primary source materials from our collections and from our partner organizations in Latin America. Um, our end goal is to actually be able to reuse the results of this work in other systems, and that could mean um, using them for enabling full text searching or providing just access to, to difficult to read handwritten materials um, or making them available for digital scholarship. So things like textual analysis or other types of natural language processing. Um, we recognize that transcription work requires very thoughtful interpretation and decision making and our citizen collaborators possess their own uh, meaningful subject knowledge of these materials. So that could be language expertise, ability to read script or handwriting, um, or subject knowledge of the materials themselves. And because of that, we believe that everyone who contributes to one of our projects deserves to be credited for their labor on our project. So we did a little bit of user research at the beginning of last year. Uh, where we did a survey and we interviewed some from the page project owners to see how they were approaching the same um, problems in preserving and reusing scholarship. Um, and we identified a few sets of challenges that everyone was encountering. Um, so the first one was determining what counts as meaningful contribution. So is it somebody who uh, shows up and transcribes a page? Do they transcribe multiple pages? Do they review the work of another citizen contributor? Um, gathering the actual identifying user information for future reuse in metadata. So the from the page username, or do you try and contact your participants and ask them how they would like to be credited? Um, one of our project team members actually got a grant during the process of this project, Ryan Sullivan, to add a field to the from the page user profile where people can add their name and how they'd like to be credited. 
Um, we had a really large set of issues around things like privacy, copyright, and ethically using contributions. Um, so we're talking about things like applying a Creative Commons license to a project um, and making that clear to project participants what will happen with the results of their labor um, when it's exported out of the system. Um, and then finally, um, workflows around preservation access. So how do you get things out of the from the page and what do you do with them once you have exported them um, and how do you use them in new contexts? Um, and the results of our findings are written up in a report that is available in Texas ScholarWorks. That's our institutional repository um, if you're interested in reading that. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ben. He's going to do a demo of the new from the page features. All right. Thank you, Alyssa. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to do a live demo. Fingers crossed. All right. So the first thing I want to demonstrate is uh, the new multilingual functionality. And this may look like the smallest piece of work, but it required first de-Englishing the whole software stack, pulling all of the English out and putting it somewhere that it could be translated by our talented translators. Um, and once that was done, the translations, of course, into Spanish and to Portuguese uh, are incorporated in the tool. So. If I am looking at a transcription screen, this is a transcript on a document, and the document's in English, but I now have the ability to change my interface to Portuguese and to Spanish. And as more translations are supplied, we hope that this will be used by other people in the open source community to add French, Japanese, other languages to support the communities we're trying to support. Uh, I'm going to change back to English for the rest of the demo. The second piece of, uh, of effort here, as Alyssa mentioned, was being able to do a faceted browsing based on metadata. Um, and so doing this browsing based on metadata means you need the metadata in the system in the first place. So if I take a look at the settings screens for one of these projects, I now have the ability to upload a spreadsheet containing any metadata from my own system uh, those would then be added to work. So you can see we uploaded a spreadsheet that has title year, end year, document type, and creator. And then I can configure facets to be used for browsing. And so in this case, I just want start year, end year, document type. Uh, and the results are that we now have uh, end users are presented with a filter that lets them narrow down what they're looking at based on, say, um, the year range or um, types of documents. You know, we want to see things that are strictly diaries. We can do that. And that reduces the search results that we see. And it really, we hope, helps people navigate things like large sets of uh, large collections of correspondence, for example. Finally, Alyssa mentioned the export features. Uh, this is something that is in beta right now, but um, is designed to help both end researchers, uh, sort of end users, and small institutions. So we've added a handful of export formats, and these are slowly growing. Uh, so we're able to let people pull down a PDF or a Microsoft Word export of this document. And I've uploaded the Word document to a, uh, a Google Drive, so I only have to share my screen a handful of times. Um, so you can see that the transcript pulled out of the system is ready to be edited and turned into a publication. Um, in addition to being able to pull things out in Microsoft Word, I'm going to share again um, Adobe Acrobat. We're able to pull these documents out again in uh, PDF format. And in addition to the researcher facing text only PDFs, um, We've also been able to create a uh, parallel text edition of embedding the image facsimile next to the transcript in these PDFs. Uh, this is something that we think will be especially useful for smaller institutions that don't have the kinds of resources for repository preservation that uh, University of Texas has. Finally, lastly, um, we've added a handful of digital humanities tool integrations to the system so that after people have transcribed the text, 
they have the ability to do something interesting with it, like, for example, uh, analyze it in Voyant. So this automatically pulls all the transcript from the system into Voyant tools where you can do um, all the things that apparently people uh, do with Voyant. I'm not an expert of Voyant myself. This is not my code. This is just uh, code that we integrated with. Uh, we've got a similar integration for uh, Jason Davies word trees tools so that we can see uh, a given word. So something like corn for these agricultural diaries, we can see the kinds of things people were doing with corn. Um, the goal being again, that this makes life easier for students who are exploring digital humanities methods. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn over the podium to Albert. Thank you, Ben. Let me go ahead and pull up my pres presentation here. All right. So um, this last part of the presentation, I'm going to be sharing with you all our current work, uh, which uh, Alyssa has given a little bit of a preview at the very beginning. Um, but first of all, uh, our next step, actually our current steps, are to deploy the um, internationalized version uh, from the page with our community partners. Um, for a couple of years now, we've been working with two partners, Community Archives in Latin America, uh, through the Latin American Digital Initiatives uh, Postcustodial Archival Development Grant uh, that we have here at Lee Les Benson. Um, we've been working, uh, you know, there have been several communities in, in the archives, but specifically for this uh, grant project, we've been working with folks at Puebla, as well as a community in Brazil. Um, and so we've integrated them into this project to be able to um, help us assess the tool that we've created, as well as other relevant documentation. The first community uh, is Puebla, or not necessarily the first in that order, but in terms of uh, this particular work, we've been working with Dr. Lilia Gomez Garcia. Uh, she's a consultant in this project, and she is a faculty member at the Meritorious Autonomous University of Puebla in Mexico. Um, Besides working with her uh, in this project to uh, digitize uh, what's called the Royal Archive of Cholula, which is housed at the State Archive of Puebla. Um, also in the past few years, we've been working with her to use from the page in her classroom. Um, that is, uh, it's, a, it's an introductory undergraduate course for history students. And uh, we've been using from the page, um, using these materials from the Royal Archive of Cholula uh, for them to hone their paleography skills. Um, and so this year, we're doing a replay of that uh, course using this tool in the archive, uh, but we're also soliciting the, uh, their feedback in terms of the uh, language appropriateness as well uh, for the platform itself. Um, so one of the things they're doing as the students is they're providing us feedback on the functionality, um, the terms that we've, we've used in Spanish to be able to uh, translate the platform. Um, so they're assessing the appropriateness as well as the correctness of the Spanish terms. Um, also on top of that, um, they are providing feedback on uh, user guides that are project GRAs or graduate research assistants, uh, Bryce McLean and our Lila's uh, Digital Scholarship Office in uh, uh, GRA, uh, Roberto Young have created uh, for this tool. And so they're also providing us feedback on the linguistic uh, as well as the uh, user guide itself, the structure of the user guide, so that we can better it uh, and later on disseminate to our uh, Spanish uh, uh, speaking audiences and, and users. Our other community partner is, in, as I mentioned, in Brazil. Um, the uh, community archive is called El Cone for short, and roughly translated in English, it's the articulation and advisory team to rural Black communities. Uh, they're based in El Dorado. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and they primarily, um, we've been working with them to digitize archives related to Quilombola uh, communities in that region. Similarly to our Puebla par partners, they are also providing linguistic assessment of the platform, but in Portuguese, uh, as well as uh, the translation of our user guides into that language. And so that's currently, uh, that's work that's currently uh, ongoing, um, and they've been, uh, we're funding their efforts through the grant to be able to provide that uh, um, feedback. 
the next section, and this is uh, this is we're finally finalizing this work that uh, Ben uh, at the very end of his demo uh, showcase. Um, one of the things that we're we're trying to finalize right now is the export feature for HTML. Um, we're trying to, with the help of our uh, past project GRA, Joshua Fisbaco, we're trying to um, edit some of those uh, details in terms of the exporting for HTML to be able to enable um, creation of exhibitions using the WAX uh, workflow uh, in GitHub. And so that we're tinkering around with that so we can be able to produce something that is reusable in that sense. Um, and the last phase, um, and probably the most intensive, we've already kind of begun that work, even though it's scheduled for later on this year. Um, we've been working with colleagues at, um, uh, at UT Libraries, uh, several of our colleagues um, who are representatives of our different uh, uh, repositories here at UT Libraries, which you see here logos of. Um, collectively, we've been brainstorming uh, various questions that came up during the needs assessment. Um, one example would be we're looking at the different metadata schema that we have and trying to figure out where is the most appropriate place to uh, credit citizen contri contributors um, of transcriptions in the archival record. Um, more broadly, our aim is to produce a white paper where we provide uh, some general best practices for others who are engaging in collaborative uh, in the preservation and uh, reusability of collaborative work uh, in repositories. Uh, we're just trying to provide a general uh, best practices. And we are providing um, a specific case study using the Texas Data Repository, considering a lot of uh, institutions here in Texas uh, use the repository to uh, provide access uh, to data. And so in this particular case, we're considering transcriptions and data. Um, we let, you know, this whole project is about giving credit where credit is due. So um, this last slide, we want to acknowledge everybody that has participated in this project. Um, as you can see, it takes a lot of effort. And so we are really thankful to our uh, project team, more broadly speaking. And of course, last but definitely not least, to the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting our grant project. And with that, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, I also want to invite you all to um, check out the tool um, and also give a little bit of a shout out to our colleagues at uh, Texas a and I'm putting them there in the chat. Uh, we're gonna invite you to explore the tool uh, by visiting the Christian Memorial Library and Archives Collaborative Project. Um, they're uh, trying to transcribe the Spanish language material. And so this would be a perfect uh, excuse for you all to try out the tool as well as help out our uh, colleagues there. Um, but with that, I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ben, um, Albert, and Alyssa. So if um, anyone has any questions um, for our last presenters, please add them in the Q&A or chat. I do have a question. Um, when you um, did um, sort of your um, user study, um, did your project owners um, ever discuss like specific cases where um, they were unable to use the description of citizen contributors? Did that come out at all? This has come up recently. I, I can't speak to the, the user study, but this has come up as part of a project that we've been involved with um, working. On, it's a AHRC funded book sprint, writing a book about crowdsourcing. And um, yeah, the, the, the term citizen in this to mean basically someone who is not a staff member is really fraught. Um, it, is, it is a challenge. Um, so, alternatives are very welcome. Um, there are definitely things that we're exploring. What we, we tend to refer to the people working on these in general as collaborators, um, which uh, we like as a, a way to describe, you know, the, for, for crowdsourcing projects, for student projects, you know, these, these, are not, these are people contributing their own expertise 
um, and knowledge, and we like that. Uh, the term collaborator itself is also fraught, so it's a challenge. And um, I, I, I have another question. Um, let's see. Has the um, feedback on um, the use of um, from the page, um, has it been generally positive from students and the people who've been able to, to use it? Uh, and Ellis, Ellis, I can talk more about this in terms of the use at UT um, and classes there. Um, for our partners, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, uh, we've been we've had positive reception in terms of the work that we've been doing. Um, we've you know we've come across some uh, challenges in terms of bandwidth right for some communities, and so um, that's one of the things that we're trying to uh, think about in terms of uh, still having. Um, the tool be useful for uh, communities that do not have the, the bandwidth connectivity. But overall, the functionality, you know, we've been investing in uh, the Greenfields role for a long time um, in terms of providing features that uh, enable different types of engagement with these materials. Uh, uh, so, uh, but in classes at UT, I know that we've had a, a positive reception from students in terms of the, the flexibility of the workspace itself. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else yeah so. yeah i think that's um accurate but um and i think people have been pleased with <clears throat> the ease of setting up a project um, we actually originally started hosting an installation from the page at ut because there was a faculty member who was working with some archival documents um annually with one of his classes and it was starting to degrade the materials and so um this is uh, Professor Adam Rabinowitz. So he worked with the libraries to get an installation from the page so that they can work, his classes can work with the materials without causing further harm to the collection. Um, and then I, I don't know that Ryan is in the room right now, um, but one of our team members, Ryan Silvent, has done some work um, with classes as well. Um, and I mean, I just have to say, Ben and Sarah are fantastic to work with. Um, anytime we have any questions or problems with them, the page, they're just, yeah, they're great. Um, they know the software in and out, and they are really open to hearing feedback. All right. Well, please give a big round of applause um, to all of our presenters today. Um, I, I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone who attended today um, learned much as well. Um, just to, to wrap it up, please join us for um, upcoming TCDL sessions tomorrow, and also check out some of our um, poster presenters. I am going to add um, some of the posters in the chat that you all could go and check out. Um, also, I also encourage you to participate in our poster scavenger hunt. Um, you can take the quiz online. Um, let me go, I'm posting the link to that as well. And finally, um, TDL is looking to gauge interest in forming a new member group around research integrity. Um, this is building on the success of um, their brief research integrity workshop series back in February. Um, and they have a survey for you to take, um, which will help um, iron out some details around this group. I am also pasting that um, in the chat as well. And again, um, thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you all around. Bye. Thanks everyone.